Okay, welcome. Welcome to the London School of Economics and Political Science for this virtual event. My name is Minoush Shafiq and I'm the President and Vice Chancellor of the LSE. The last decade has been dominated by low interest rates and low inflation in the advanced economies. And many wondered whether low for long would be the future. But the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine have brought a period of historically high inflation globally, which has only recently begun to slow to show any signs of easing. The world is not yet out of the woods, and while with many still arguing about whether there will be recessions in various countries. The monetary tightening necessary to curb inflation has contributed to declining output by dampening economic activity. Given the centrality of the dollar in global commerce, a rapidly strengthening dollar has added inflationary pressure by raising the costs of imports for various economies and has increased borrowing costs for many developing countries, many of which are near or in debt distress. These trends over the last three years have raised questions about the need for greater international cooperation and coordination to manage the spillovers of monetary policy across borders. For example, what forms of international monetary cooperation are necessary to prevent further economic damage due to the twin crises of pandemic and war? How aligned are the interests of advanced and emerging economies in the realm of monetary policy coordination, given the outsized influence of the US on the global monetary system? What can be done given that central bank mandates are essentially national and not designed to address spillovers, although they can take into account so-called spillbacks onto the national economy? And can existing global governance mechanisms be used to address the impact of inflation on lower income groups that are hardest hit by the exogenous shocks over which they have very little control nor capacity to manage? Answering these sorts of questions is exactly the motivation that drove the creation of our LSE Global Economic Governance Commission, hosted by LSE Ideas, which are co-hosting this event today. LSE's, LSE Ideas is LSE's foreign policy think tank, and through sustained engagement with policymakers and opinion formers, Ideas provides a forum that informs debate and connects academic research with the practice of diplomacy and strategy. The LSE Global Economic Governance Commission is a forum for debating and re redesigning global economic governance. The Commission hosts public and closed door panels, lectures and workshops on all matters related to global economic governance. As usual, uh, after the talk today, there'll be a chance for you to ask questions and for our online audience, please submit those by, via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and also tell us your name and affiliation. And we're particularly keen to hear from students and alumni. And for those who are using Twitter, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSEGEGC and hashtag LSE Global Governance. The event is being recorded and will be made available online. And with all that housekeeping now out of the way, let me turn to our panel who are here to help us explore these very interesting questions. First, we'll have Ricardo Rees, who's the A.W. Phillips Professor of Economics at the LSE. He's published widely on macroeconomics, including both monetary and fiscal policy, inflation and business cycles, and he's been the recipient of many prizes for his research. He's also a consultant and advisor to the Bank of England, the Reichsbank, and the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, and he directs the Center for Macroeconomics here at the LSE in the UK. He also serves as an advisor to many other organizations, and he's recently published a book, which I suspect he'll talk a little bit about in his presentation. After Ricardo, we will hear from Brad Setzer, who's the Whitney Shepherdson Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Prior to joining the council, Setzer served as a senior advisor to the United States Trade Representative and as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Economic Analysis in the US Treasury. He's the author of the book, Sovereign Wealth and Sovereign Power, and the co-author with Norio Rubini of Bailouts and Bail-ins, Responding to Financial Crises in Emerging Economies. And he will speak after Ricardo. Welcome, welcome Ricardo, welcome Brad. We're delighted to have you both here. So let me turn now to Ricardo to start his presentation. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to join you here to discuss this topic, um, which is, of course, could not be more important when it comes to some of the macro challenges that we're facing today. The question posed for this event was, can the world defeat inflation without an international accord? Over the next 12 to 15 minutes, I'm going to make four points, starting or four and a half if you want, because the half is going to be the easier one, which is going to be the answer to that question. But I'm then going to elaborate into making four different points and broadening somewhat, because even if even though this question was a very concrete one, its implications, and especially the need for international cooperation, as Minouche just mentioned, across a wide variety of dimensions in the macro agenda, are broader and go beyond this particular question. And I will touch on them while starting on it. But first, let me start with the half, or maybe more accurately, the 0 0.05, which is the answer to the question, can the world defeat inflation without an international accord? And I think the answer is a clear yes, it can. International <laughs> accords or cooperations are not necessary for an individual country to defeat inflation, especially and especially for a combination of countries to defeat inflation. And why do I say this with a certain amount of uh, firmness, if you want, why such an unqualified yes, it can defeat it? I say it because ultimately, inflation is determined, is controlled, is set, or at least strongly influenced by the actions of central banks in pursuit of their mandate. And right now, most economies, it, most advanced economies, as well as a large part of emerging market economies, do have, or not a large part, but some part, have very, very clear inflation targets. Independent central banks that through all the, the problems and the ups and downs last year and a half have kept their independence in the pursuit of their mandate. And insofar as central banks can deliver it, uh, it therefore seems clear that they will be trying to bring down inflation back to these targets. And can they deliver it? Well, here we talk indeed about these international uh, accords, cooperations, or potentially even conflicts, which turns me then to my first point here. It is certainly the case that if one lives in a regime like we had with Bretton Woods following the Second World War all the way into the early 1970s, it is impossible or at least very hard for a country individually and certainly a small economy to be able to defeat inflation. After all, the Bretton Woods Agreement comes with a system of fixing exchange rates to the dollar. If US inflation is high, there is simply no way for you to stay in Britain Woods when that inflation is high. Indeed, when we look at the 1970s and a country which was mostly successful in controlling inflation, West Germany, it did so precisely because of the end of Bretton Woods in the early 1970s. All of the other countries, and insofar as the, the exit from Bretton Woods was not a completely clean and radical cut, all ended up uh, suffering, if you want, the spillovers or the consequences of a high inflation rate in the US, making it effectively very difficult for you to control inflation by yourself. Likewise, today, for countries that have fixed their exchange rate, or at least are trying to very actively manage a float that involves uh, other economies, only insofar as those other economies are successful in controlling inflation, can those countries themselves be able to at least have a chance of being able to control inflation. Well, what do we see now? When we see pegs, or at least attempts to control exchange rates, they tend to have to do with the dollar, and mostly the dollar, and a little bit of the euro, in depending on some region, especially in Eastern Europe and some of Northern Africa. Well, both the Fed and the ECB are extremely committed to their inflation targets, and are, without any hesitation, doing what it takes to bring inflation down. Therefore, insofar as they succeed in doing so, well, then you will have that for the other countries, even just in keeping their exchange rate peg, they will be able to succeed in that dimension. That leads, though, to the even just for the euro, and especially as we look for even floating exchange rate countries like Canada or like the United Kingdom, can they control inflation independently given their floats? Well, we have learned in economic theory over the last 20 years, that even if you float your exchange rate, you will have a lot of trouble being able to control inflation if, and this if, well, should not be an if, given that we have a world in which the US dollar is so dominant in so many transactions, which implies therefore that if US inflation is well above target, 
if U.S. monetary policy is not adequately contractionary or expansionary as needed to bring inflation on target, then it is very hard for a country like the United Kingdom to be able to keep inflation under control because of the spillovers of U.S. monetary policy towards its economy and towards the spillovers of just the movement in inflation in the U.S., as Minus was already mentioning, spilling over towards the price of commodities and leading to important inflation. So if do we need an accord, we would if the U.S. had abandoned the inflation target, we would if the U.S. was engaging in a monetary policy that would lead to its inflation going under control. Insofar as the U.S. pursues its, um, pursues its mandate and delivers on inflation, then no, I don't think we need an international accord. Simply the U.S. trying to deliver 2% will put a very strong uh, disinflation effect in all of the other countries, both floating and fixed exchange rate countries. And in doing so, then those central banks dealing with their own internal problems will in itself also bring inflation down. That's my first point. Bring inflation down is a necessary, not sufficient, but necessary condition for bringing global inflation down is for the US to bring inflation down, basically, and the euro uh, closely followed. But insofar as they do that, it's unclear that we need an accord beyond that. Second point, though, and making the accord be a little more interesting, if you want. Second point is that in the process, though, of that inflation coming down, surely different countries will, given both domestic shocks that affect those economies and circumstances, as well as the actions, correct or incorrect, of their central banks, are going to have inflation coming down at different speeds. With that inflation coming down at different speeds, though, what will happen inevitably, almost inexorably, is that you will have exchange rate adjustments. The price at which currencies in those countries exchange with the dollar, the euro, and others will move around. And what we know from the study of exchange rates for now many, many years is that exchange rates can be very volatile and overreact to these differentials, either of monetary policy and or of inflation across borders. What that implies is that any of these in the process of inflation coming down, we can have a lot of exchange rate volatility. And together with the exchange rate volatility, we may have also, and this is not a redundant point, uh, capital flow volatility into and out of those countries. Uh, even regardless of, even without exchange of volatility, we have learned that capital flow volatility can emerge. What that means is that in the world as well, over the last 10, 15 years, there has been a quite significant change. Certainly, if you look at the think tanks or the thought leaders that are the IMF or the Bank of International Settlements and others, towards having countries intervene quite actively, both through capital flow management and different tools of macroprudential policy, as well as direct capital flow interventions, as well as through foreign exchange interventions. And it has become a new uh, consensus, one that completely breaks radically with the old Washington sense of the 90s, that countries do and should indeed do some intervention on that exchange rate. Here, yes, an accord may be needed, or cracks may show up that make it very difficult for individual countries. One can certainly imagine a path for the next uh, year, two, or three, where in the process of inflation coming out at different speeds in different countries, we end up with very large exchange rate and capital flow volatility. We end up with a lot of stress putting put on these capital flow management tools. And we end up with countries needing some global coordination in being able to uh, manage, if you want that. There will certainly be a view, a very respectable view, that says that we should just let the exchange rate move around and not try to manage it. We know, though, from and um, from financial crisis and the history of financial crisis, the topic of this book I have coming out in a few months, that uh, those unfettered movements of capital and unfettered fluctuations in exchange rates can very easily lead to financial crashes that lead to losses. A potential way of at least dealing with those was going to have to involve some cooperation along some ways. Note, by the way, that when we talk about the symmetry, of course, a key asymmetry in the last six months was the fact that the invasion of Ukraine uh, put a much created a shock in Europe that did not exist in the US. If that were to persist towards further increase in energy prices, um, not just the level of it persisting at a high level, but further increases, then that would put a lot of pressure on the euro dollar exchange rate. Capital flows between the euro area and the dollar would not probably be a problem themselves. But for the countries that try to manage their exchange rate, partly in a balance with the euro, partly in a balance with the dollar, that would put remarkable stress 
uh, over their ability to do so. Third point. This, of course, was, and this coordination came with uh, countries wanting to deliver 2%. I said, I think the US, the Euro area are certainly committed to do so. And I implicitly said, so are the other countries when I noted it is what is in their mandate in most of them to deliver low inflation. But one must ask, it is imperative to ask whether this commitment to an inflation target and to stable inflation will survive much longer in the next few years. What could make it crack? I think both economic history, that is the experience on control of inflation, as well as I think an analysis of the current um, main constraints in, the, in many countries' macro data or macro variables, is that perhaps the main reason why some countries and not others, because again, asymmetries is the key here, would be more sanguine versus more bold or, le- or more shy about controlling inflation has to do with pressures on their public debt. Public debt is remarkably high in many countries for good reasons. But public debt is, I think, although there's a very active debate on this, there's an LSE view shared by myself and Charles Goodhart, and there's a, a, a view that's been very much exposed by Olivia Blanchard and Larry Summers, whereas they think that interest rates are going to be very low within the next year or two. Charles and myself have argued that we think interest rates are on the rise up, the so-called R stars or real interest rates, um, if you look two or three years ahead. That is that regardless of what happens to inflation, it's going to be harder to pay for the debt. Let me briefly tell you what our arguments are, and that um, even if they're not the topic of this panel, but may come up in discussion. The argument for why I think R star will be higher is one, that I think there will be an inflation risk premium. There will be investors will want some compensation for inflation after the expense of the last two years. Second, that next generation EU and the RA and the US are going to absorb a lot of savings into uh, investment in, in public capital and private capital and away from public debt. Third, that geopolitical changes will imply that we'll have much less appetite for the public debt of um, um, European countries coming from South Asia. And finally, fourth, that demographic changes are going to mean that just the excess of savings is going to slowly but surely start diminishing um, over the next few years. And as a result, cent- public authorities are going to feel more of a tension in terms of being able to keep their debt under control. As they do so, the therefore the incentive, if you want, the pressure to tell the central bank also help out by keeping interest rates low, even if that involves jeopardizing the inflation target, is going to start being a binding constraint in many countries. And so that, insofar as that affects countries very differentially, and we know that these um, interest rate government debt are indeed quite volatile and different across countries, I think that there's a source of pressure. In that is the case, then we need not an accord, but we get to the other part of today's panel that Minouche well uh, presented, which is the extent to which international organizations that deal with debt problems, public debt problems around the world, become the, if you want, victim of inflation, as well as the cause of inflation persisting, and the extent to which those are there for the task. Not just the IMF, but also institutions like the Paris Club and the World Bank when it comes to negotiating that. And here, I think there are serious reasons to be concerned, some that have been explored in other areas here at the LSE, having to do especially with what's going on in Sri Lanka, and that has to do with the very large differences in the composition of foreign debt over the last 20 years, with the increase of official debt, as well as debt, as well as credits coming from China and other parts of the world, which are untested when it comes to their willingness to cooperate when we have a debt crisis. The events of Sri Lanka the last six months are really quite of a warning insofar as Sri Lanka needs desperately there to be some resolution in terms of haircuts on its debt. And yet it has found that with a very large share of its debt being owed directly and both private and public to China and India, it has found very hard for the Paris Club coordination among those creditors. And that is something that will be a challenge, I think, very, very soon related to inflation. And that was my third point. Fourth and final point, but related, when we talk about the inequality caused by inflation and the spillovers, it is natural to think about how inflation comes with some goods, prices going a little up, that more up than others, and to worry about especially the more disadvantaged in a society being the ones that uh, are closer to, if they have even slightly higher inflation, 
having trouble making ends meet. But if one takes a somewhat broader perspective that crosses borders, and one looks at the direct effect of inflation of the last 18 months, the most, if you want, disproportional or unequal impact of this inflation burst has been that those who bought government debt have suffered very, very large losses. This had already happened in the 1970s, by the way, but those who had, were holding US treasuries or government bonds have suffered very, very large losses. Who are these? Well, a large extent of them, and this will be my way to conclude so that Brad can second to Brad, who's an expert on these things, but some of this are precisely um, governments in emerging market economies that have accumulated very large reserves in dollars over the last um, 20 years. When the dust settles of this inflation, you will have that those countries have lost very large extents of those. And they will realize that these reserves they had at foreign currency and foreign bonds were maybe a particularly risky thing to do, changing both their attitudes towards whole those bonds directly, but generally changing their attitudes towards how to use the global financial system and how to think about its architecture based with the treasury bonds at its heart, but also with institutions like the IMF and others. That reevaluation requires perhaps even more than an accord. We'll put pressure, together with my previous point, on there being a new rethinking of what the international financial architecture is, the combination of the IMF, World Bank, Paris Club, together with the U.S. Treasury as the key safe asset to the world, is one that has prevailed for many years. It is one that is persistently discussed as having cracks. I think the inflation episode puts further cracks in it. It will net, will it be that this time that we get a complete new rearranged institutions? I doubt it, but certainly it is something to keep an eye when we discuss. Uh, international accords or the topics of this uh, of this panel, and they may come up later. And with that, I'll stop and pass over to Brad. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Ricardo. Thank you, uh, LSE and Manoush, for uh, this uh, invitation. It's an extremely uh, interesting topic. Um, I actually kind of agree with Ricardo's uh, initial answer that uh, inflation can be addressed effectively without a global accord. I think he made, Ricardo made a very uh, important point, which is that given the dollar centrality of the system, uh, inflation uh, is largely determined globally by what happens in the U.S. And if the U.S. acts effectively to contain inflation at home, one of the byproducts of that is that it will contain inflation uh, globally. Of course, another byproduct of that is that uh, tighter U.S. monetary policy gets transmitted in various ways globally, and that creates other uh, strains and difficulties in the system. So I thought I would uh, sort of divide my remarks into uh, roughly four parts. Uh, the first part would review some of the shocks uh, that gave rise to the inflation and, and since gave rise to the question of whether coordination is an appropriate, is necessary. Uh, then second, look uh, a little bit at some of the uh, tensions that have come from the monetary policy response to inflation, in part because in the increase in inflation, in inflation hasn't been entirely uniform. Uh, then second, discuss, or third, discuss a little bit um, some of the questions that come up with respect to energy policy coordination, because I think in addition to the monetary component, the inflation that's been observed over the past uh, uh, year in particular has had a very clear uh, component that stems from the, the energy markets. And then finally, talk a little bit more about some of the spillovers into uh, from monetary tightening into capital flows and into um, the cost of servicing legacy debts. Um, I mean, it's one of the great ironies of our modern global financial system is that China chose to denominate its great lending wave in dollars 
and to link its lending to short-term U.S. interest rates. So countries that borrow very heavily from China end up facing increasing uh, debt burdens as the U.S., not China, adjusts its monetary policy. But first, uh, some of the shocks. I think the nature of the shocks is sort of important for understanding the spillovers and the arguments for uh, coordination. And the first shock is the obvious shock, which was that the pandemic itself was uh, a shock to supply, uh, probably a more persistent shock to supply than we realized. Uh, some reduction in the willingness of people around the world to enter into the labor market. Um, and in sectors like uh, automobiles, which you would think would be something that could be produced largely by robots and uh, would be uh, relatively insulated from the direct uh, effect of a respiratory virus in some sense. Uh, for a host of reasons, global auto supply fell back in the pandemic and is only now recovering. So there's going to kind of clear set of uh, 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 consequences from the pandemic that have had a lasting legacy on on the scope of the economy to produce goods and services. And the second shock was clearly the policy accommodation in the U.S. in particular, but uh, to a degree also in Europe, that was meant to offset concerns that the pandemic wouldn't just be a supply shock, but would be a demand shock that People who left the labor force because of concerns about the disease would see a big loss of income, and that loss of income would, uh, in a low for long world, be a new shock that pulled us back into uh, a deeply depressed conditions. Uh, that risk was averted, uh, but the strength of the policy accommodation uh, created a surplus in some cases of demand in some economies, particularly in the US, and most acutely uh, a surplus in demand for goods as uh, the composition of what the economy demanded shifted away from services and person to person interaction towards traded goods. And I think uh, the ECB has quite correctly said that the strength of U.S. fiscal and to a degree monetary accommodation and the impact that had on a good, the goods market meant that the shock was transmitted uh, more globally than would have been the case in more normal economic times. Uh, the third shock was obviously Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the impact that has had on global energy markets, uh, the oil market, but equally uh, markets for traded gas and traded coal. It, it's in some ways been a much broader shock uh, than even the energy shocks of the 1970s because it, it extends beyond uh, uh, oil and uh, the um, uh, refined product. Uh, like uh, the oil market differentiates between uh, oil and LNG and traded gas and you know, coal is sort of as out there as a substitute for gas. So this became a much broader, deeper shock in some ways. Clearly, these shocks are a bit asymmetric. The uh, shock to gas in particular is uh, much more acute in Europe. Uh, but the shock is not confined to Europe either. I mean, oil prices were felt very acutely. Higher oil prices were felt acutely around the world. So the fact that there are these global shocks, that they have uh, strong effects throughout the world economy creates uh, some intrinsic uh, case for uh, coordination. Uh, a synchronized response to a global shock uh, can at least uh, in some ways help manage the effects with fewer uh, spillovers. But uh, full coordination is difficult. And clearly, uh, the uh, uh, while this, most of the shocks were global, not all of the policy responses initially were uniform. Uh, I think it is important to note that China, by and large, uh, had a different approach to managing COVID and also uh, provided much less stimulus in response to the COVID shock than other economies, and therefore has been subject to much less inflationary pressure. And then equally, the uh, the natural gas shock is much more acutely felt in those economies that rely on traded gas. So with respect to uh, monetary policy, um, Ricardo's discussed this in depth, so I will uh, uh, be sort of brief. Um, but I think, you know, clearly the great 
question uh, comes from the outsized impact of the United States and policy tightening in the US on the global economy. There's a the standard argument with floating exchange rates is that any one country can address an inflationary shock in its own economy by tightening its own monetary policy. That works in part by uh, appreciating the exchange rate, uh, expanding uh, the inflationary pressure globally, but also distributing demand globally. So if the de there's a surplus of demand in one economy, that uh, demand uh, spreads and is met more effectively by supply around the world. Now, that doesn't work as well in a case where the global economy as a whole is supply constrained. Um, and then in the U.S.'s case, when the U.S. tightens, uh, it doesn't just tighten for itself. It also tightens for uh, other countries, uh, both because of the use of the dollar globally and because some countries still manage their currency primarily against the dollar. The opposite uh, approach to having a, a, an asynchronized response where each country reacts individually to uh, these shocks would be for the entire world to raise interest rates uh, in a coordinated way together, even if the shock is more concentrated in one country. That approach would have meant uh, less pressure on exchange rates uh, because uh, interest rates go up together. Um, and it runs the risk that the policy tightening in some countries would be bigger than is necessary uh, for their own conditions. Uh, but it would trade that off against less exchange rate uh, volatility. I think in general, uh, the response to the last round of inflationary pressure was to some degree a generalized increase in uh, global interest rates, uh, with some countries arguably feeling pressured to raise uh, rates higher than their own domestic conditions uh, warranted because of the strength of uh, the transmission uh, from uh, higher U.S. rates to a weaker currency to higher energy prices that you know, added to the uh, imported inflation components. But that was clearly not uh, uniform. Uh, the two biggest economies in Asia have largely sat out uh, this policy tightening cycle. Uh, Japan has not increased interest rates. China uh, has not adjusted its rates either, although with China, there's always um, some complex mechanisms of monetary transmission. And I think as Ricardo alluded to, this discrepancy in response did generate significant pressure on, uh, on the exchange rates. And that pressure on exchange rates uh, was very, very acute for a while last summer. And it was also met to some um, important way by a uh, an, a globally uncoordinated response, but maybe one that worked. Uh, Japan intervened in the market. Japan uh, sold some of its uh, foreign exchange reserves. That, I think, prevented the yen from overshooting, helped prevent energy prices in Japan from becoming a, an added driver of extra inflationary shock. And it helped prevent uh, more generalized uh, exchange rate pressures in Asia from, uh, from overshooting. Uh, but it was clearly not fully coordinated. It was it was sort of uh, it wasn't criticized by the world, but it was, was not a joint intervention by any measure. Uh, Korea engaged in similar practices, similar policy approaches. I think they also worked, and China, in its own complex way, seems to have also managed its exchange rate. So compared to a world where everybody chooses their autonomous uh, interest rate. And the exchange rate goes where it, uh, it sort of naturally happens with some risk of overshooting. We didn't end up in that world, but we didn't end up in that world not because of formal coordination, but because a significant number of countries have uh, an additional policy tool because of their large stocks of reserves. Uh, briefly, uh, I wanted to talk about the global response to the um, the energy shock, because I do think it is uh, important. Uh, 
Uh, and I think some of the spillovers from energy are uh, sometimes underappreciated as a source of, of global stress. Uh, I think the first observation is that there actually was uh, a degree of coordination in the application of sanctions to the uh, global energy markets through the G7. Uh, and that coordination, largely in the first instance, was a coordinated decision to try to limit the sanctions to sectors other than energy. Uh, the initial policy response, for better or for worse, preserved Russia's capacity to receive payments in dollars and euros uh, for, its, for its oil and for its gas. Nonetheless, there was a pretty significant uh, a shock to the market just because of uh, some of the, the difficulties in getting oil to market as associated with the conflict. But there was coordination, and I think there's been further coordination in the sense that the US and the EU have converged around an approach to sanctioning Russian oil in particular that aims to uh, assure that the oil flows to global markets, but at a discount because it's not allowed to flow to its natural markets in Europe. But it is arguably a coordinated response in the sense that uh, the US and the EU and Japan have all agreed to an approach that adds friction to the oil market, but doesn't try to lock Russia's oil in Russia. There was also an uncoordinated response that was important. The U.S. use of its strategic petroleum reserve helped buffer some of the initial pressure on uh, the global market. And I think it was actually generated uh, quite positive global spillovers. But for the strategic petroleum reserve, global prices would have been higher uh, and the global energy shock would have hit poorer countries and others even more profoundly. I think conversely, the EU's necessary decision to accelerate filling its natural gas uh, reservoirs last summer put truly unprecedented pressure on globally traded natural gas prices, and it effectively froze or uh, kept many poorer countries out of the market. So there was a, there was a negative spillover there uh, in the economic sense. Uh, while there was an enormous security externality from getting uh, the European reservoirs filled. But in a, a, a generic sense, I think it does reveal a gap in the energy architecture. Uh, I'm worried a little bit that there isn't a big enough globally available oil reserve that matches the US strategic petroleum reserve in a world of more geoeconomic fragmentation and greater risk of energy shocks and structurally tighter markets. I equally think uh, there needs to be a little bit more buffer capacity in the natural gas market, bigger standing reservoirs, more capacity, more um, uh, ability to use trade LNG, which ultimately means having uh, terminals that can do so available if needed, and that is not the currently the case. Uh, final point, and I, it, it's a place where I think there is a need for coordination, and the coordination has been completely lacking, and that is in dealing with some of the uh, spillovers between monetary tightening, particularly in the U.S., and global uh, debt problems. The pressures on low-income economies are in no way uniform. Uh, there are a number of countries that are in relatively solid financial position. They have fortress balance sheets. I know Ricardo is, has noted that countries that uh, have large reserve stocks have seen the value of those reserves eroded in real terms. But the countries that have had large reserve shocks hold more foreign currency reserves and their government has foreign currency debt, have also largely been buffered from the most extreme effects of US policy tightening. They've generally been able to maintain access to uh, capital markets. They haven't faced a sudden sh stop in the availability of private capital. The weaker economies around the world uh, have really had a difficult period. As I noted at the start, uh, 
China's policy lending is denominated in dollars and linked to short-term interest rates. So the cost of borrowing from China has shot up. US policy tightening always squeezes the marginal borrow out of the market. And one of the marginal borrowers in the global system were the weaker frontier economies who've effectively been priced out of the market. And so the world is now confronted, I think, with two separate problems. One is the problem of the legacy debts, countries that borrowed in the previous cycle that can't pay uh, with a more diverse set of uh, creditors. And then uh, a second problem, which is that flows to the Africa, to low income parts of the world have completely collapsed. I think when the final data is available for 2022, it will become clear that the flows actually have reversed, that repayments exceed new flows. And so there, there is a dearth of investment capital facing uh, the low income parts of the world. Both of these problems require coordination to solve. The institutions for coordination for dealing with the legacy debt problems have absolutely failed. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, no country which has had debts to China and debts to the market and has actually needed meaningful debt reduction has successfully gotten that debt reduction. Countries have been blocked from getting IMF financing for up to a year after the initial default. So the IMF has been uh, unable to play its core role in the system. And there isn't really a model that has established a clear path to effective resolution and coming out of a debt problem with uh, a sustainable debt stock. And then the second problem, I think during the period of COVID, the world actually did come together and through the IMF provided us some financing for low-income countries. The World Bank stretched its balance sheet, flows from the official sector in the first year of COVID actually kept global financing moving towards the low-income countries. The IMF SDR allocation helped last year, or helped in 2021, not last year. But this past 2020, uh, the low-income countries have really taken it on the chin. And I do think that there needs to be a new global effort, a coordinated effort to address a problem which stems both from the withdrawal of Chinese policy lending and the lack of market financing for this big set of countries. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much. We've covered lots of interesting, interesting ground. Let me uh, start with two questions and then I will turn to those coming in from the audience. Uh, so, so I think we all, I, I agree with you that we don't need international coordination to bring inflation down. I think, I think Ricardo's half answer on that was, was spot on, um, but I think what we what you both described is a system in which, you know, uh, national policy driven by independent central banks with clear inflation targets, plus some ad hoc national actions with spillovers can muddle through uh, a shock, and in the end will help bring inflation down. But you've both identified the fact that there are large losses that are occurring with our current system that we could do a bet we could do a better job of managing these kinds of shocks. And it seems to me you've identified two, you know, you can either reduce these losses by doing better ex ante insurance through reserve pooling uh, and more efficient mechanisms like better use of the IMF and uh, better, better ways to reduce the kind of costs of national level insurance and the, you know, what Ricardo referred to as all those countries holding dollar and euro debt in their reserves who've now taken a huge hit. There must, you know, there must be a better way to do ex ante insurance. The other option is a better way of dealing with ex post consequences with more sensible approaches to sovereign debt restructuring, which is a, an issue that's been around for a very, very long time um, and has gotten so much more complex given the increased role of China as a, as a sovereign creditor. Um, so I just wanted you both to say something about what could be done to have a system that worked better with better ex ante insurance and better ex post restructuring of debts that, that go wrong. Maybe Ricardo, if you want to start. 
Sure. Uh, let me make two related points. The first one is one that you um, highlighted clearly, which but it's a much more general point, which is that ultimately when we have periods of high inflation, and the reason why inflation is such a problem that occupies so much attention, is that periods of sudden high inflation or high and coming down and coming up are periods that come with very large redistributions of wealth. Exactly. This is a classic topic when one looks at, for instance, the last uh, nine months in Western economies and one looks at wages updating and the extent to which some workers are left behind and others not and leads to the amount of industrial conflict we're seeing in so many countries. It is a classic question when one looks at um, in investment, those who uh, borrow versus those who lend. But it is also, and I try to shed a little bit of light on it, and Manush, and you've done more now, in terms of across borders. When we have shocks and in inflation and the associated movements in exchange rates, that both Brad and I noted, you can have some very large redistributions of wealth across places. And if there's one lesson we learn from inflation, from studying inflation, is that you really want to keep your eye on those redistributions to try and understand why inflation becomes such a problem, so costly, and what it is. Beyond my first initial point, which then I expanded in Brad as well into all of the cracks that show up, a lot of them are associated with exactly what you said. And so once you understand that this is a risk that has heterogeneous effects, then you end up applying precisely the language that you applied, which I didn't. Um, but I think it's a good language in your question, which is let's talk about just insurance. If it's a shock that comes with distribution, some suffer, some suffer more, some suffer less, then we should be talking about ex ante or ex post. How do we come up with some pooling of risk mechanism whereby those who suffer the most get a bit of a transfer, those suffer the most? So that's my first answer to your question, which is let me go to your language, which I think is a good language of putting it because it puts the finger on the important consequences of these inflation episodes, more than the coming up or coming down, but the distribution. So then, when it comes to the ex ante point, I think that the traditional answer has been that when you have inflation episodes, and this is a very old answer, one that dates back all the way to Milton Friedman, is that this is where floating exchange rates are so important. That when you have these inflation shocks across borders, part of why it's important to have floating exchange rates, having exchange rates move around, is precisely so that we have an inbuilt price mechanism automatic in the price business sense, there will discipline some of those. But of course, over the last 20 plus years, at least, we have learned that those exchange rates are very volatile and we should manage them and they overshoot and they're a very imperfect uh, market insurance mechanism to deal with those differentials in inflation and shocks. And so Brad already noted that having reserves and intervening, and he, he brought in the cases of Japan and Korea, is a way to improve those. But they do come with this large loss of having these large piles of reserves uh, that we understand. And because of the stock effects, I worried more than Brad that once we do all the accounting in three years, as opposed to what happened in the last six months and who won or lost, we will see that um, these large reserves came now with an extra cost that wasn't quite anticipated in terms of their erosion of value. And so, as you say, ex ante, I think the doing reserves, we had already for a long time been discussing how holding so many of these reserves was so costly in terms of just foregone interest, because after all, you're holding these very low yielding foreign currency and bonds. I think we we're going to learn also that holding these foreign reserves to intervene that way is a particularly costly way to manage capital flows and exchange of volatility falling in differential inflation shock. Sorry for the long rant, but that's kind of the one sentence summary of what I, I've said in the last five minutes. So I think we're going to reassess on how indeed important that is, uh, how costly that is. Once you realize how costly it is, then you end up with, um, uh, Minouche, as you put it, the fact that can we not just do better than that? Uh, can we do be not do better than just floating exchange rates plus uh, foreign exchange interventions? Let's put it that way. Somewhat. And I think that, um, again, this is a discussion that we've been having for a very long time, as you all put it, in terms of, look, should we have macroprudential tools? Should we have capital flow, uh, capital tax or capital controls in different ways and others? Um, but instead of just repeating that literature, which is a very long one, and probably I would be incompetent in doing it, um, let's think about how inflation affects that or how the differentials in inflation affect that. And to a first approximation, at least immediately, obviously, in terms of the inflation problems that we're talking about, it's... It does seem that in terms of those differentials, those policies that have been discussed and have been proposed, macroprudential, capital controls of different types, that's switching on and off, um, would be effective, meaning they would be 
it doesn't seem that the inflation problem hurts them or makes them particularly um, un, um, difficult because many of the problems with those policies generally have to do with coordination of treasury and uh, central banks. In this case, it is the central bank cares about inflation, also cares about this. And so some of those problems go away. They have to do with how quickly you want to apply them. But again, here, a lot of it has to do with coordination with interest rates and others. So I would say that in principle, this puts an extra weight of moving towards those and away from just stocks of reserves for precautionary reason. Um, all else equal. I may be missing some channels, but at least it seems like clear that the inflation shocks make the precautionary reserves more costly. And I don't see it hurting, at least uh, right now, the relative benefits of using other capital flow management tools. This is on inflation alone. And then, sorry, I'll just take another minute. Of course, on the other shocks, and I highlight a lot the debt problems. Um, Brad rightly said, well, let's make a distinction here between the flow and the stock, the legacy debt, as well as the new borrowers. I said that I think this is important and inflation has made this, the inflation shock has made this worse by pushing up the debt service that will be required post this inflation episode. And for those, it is crucial how, um, and I think here we're in agreement, in a sad agreement, because all of us, I think, would not to be agree on this. The current system is just woefully inadequate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just clear that, um, like Brad said, the IMF moves too late. Like you said, Minouche, there's a sense in which debt restructuring is basically a non-star. I mean, it's something where we've essentially made no progress in many decades by now. And you really think that there has to be something better. I mean, you look even at, at the national level, at the domestic level, as one may complain about bankruptcy codes and things of that type. Still, we've made progress in the last 30 years. And I think we do a better job. And just look at what we did even during COVID in terms of moratorium, in terms of handling with bankruptcy codes within for companies in the countries. Across borders, there just really seems to be very little progress. And that's absolutely would be my number of priority, would be my focus would be on the debt. How do we deal with that? Because not just the stock, but also because these differential shocks the last few years, very different impacts, the stock versus flow problem. In here, neither the exact, both the exact and the ex post minutia need so much work that even just answering your question saying which one needs more work is hard. Just both of them were such in a bad position to start with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Brad, do you want to add something? Maybe a, a, a few uh, observations. Um, one, one observation is just uh, to note that when it comes to reserve pooling, there's this uh, enormous, and I think other people have noticed this as well, uh, discrepancy between the uh, insurance mechanisms that are in place amongst the G10 countries to deal with uh, shocks to the foreign currency liquidity of the financial system where there's almost full insurance through the reciprocal swap lines. So if uh, a financial institution in Japan needs dollars, uh, the Bank of Japan can get those dollars from the Fed and acts as a dollar lender of last resort in Japan in a way that uh, wouldn't be the case if a an emerging economy wanted uh, foreign exchange for intervention purposes. Now, I think there are good reasons for that. Um, uh, I, I think it's uh, institutionally hard to change. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if you look at some of the problems with the Chinese swap lines around the world, uh, providing swaps to low income countries to finance intervention can create problems of its own. It does, uh, uh, it becomes a for risk becoming a form of long term debt, rather than a basis for providing uh, uh, dollar liquidity against sound dollar assets globally. So there's a fundamental difference in what the reserves are being used for. But it is the case that there's almost full insurance amongst the G10 for foreign currency liquidity needs arising from the financial system. And there's become effectively almost no insurance uh, amongst emerging economies or no effective insurance amongst emerging economies who need reserves to help manage their own debt to have scope for unilateral intervention in the foreign currency market. So unsurprisingly, the big stockpiles of uh, foreign exchange have migrated into the emerging world and become quite big. Self-insurance is dominant. I do think we need to reflect a little bit more about why the IMF can't use some of its trillion dollars to play a little bit more of an insurance role. I think there's a, a gap there that is not being uh, met, uh, but it is also clearly the case that 
Uh, Self-insurance still the dominant strategy for most emerging economies. Mm -hmm. And the safety, point of safety that has emerged is holding more foreign currency reserves than your government holds foreign currency debt. So that in an event of a dollar shock, you're actually long dollars. In terms of dealing with the legacies of uh, too much borrowing in the past, the architecture for sovereign restructuring, I think there are two separate uh, issues that are both uh, important. One is, I actually think there has been progress on the architecture for restructuring sovereign bonds. Maybe I played a role in that, so I'm biased. Uh, but bond contracts have evolved fundamentally over the past 25 years and have much more, much stronger embedded mechanisms for coordination uh, than was the case before. So a modern bond contract allows all the bonds to vote together on restructuring terms. That makes it a lot easier in theory. It doesn't solve the problem that Zambia is now confronting, which is that the bondholders don't believe that they need collectively, they need to reduce the value of their claims. They're disagreeing with the IMF's assessment. Equally, uh, I think it is fair to say that while there was progress on the bond restructuring side, the bilateral architecture, the architecture for coordinating claims of governments and the restructuring of those claims has kind of broken down, um, partially because China hasn't wanted to join the standard architecture, hasn't wanted to join the Paris Club, hasn't wanted to accept the constraints on the Paris Club. But I also think we just have to recognize that while the G7 countries have viewed their bilateral lending uh, to low-income countries as a form of aid and have basically moved towards a concessional model, China is now bigger and China doesn't have a concessional model. Mm -hmm. So there's no coordination solution when the problem is a different difference in interest. It is not, despite what the Chinese sometimes say, it is the barrier to getting China to reduce the value of the policy bank's claims on low-income countries is not really that the traditional Paris Club doesn't want to reduce the value of their claims. There are Paris Clubs already on concessional terms. The barrier is that China has yet to make the fundamental decision to move towards concessional terms. Okay, thank you very much. I've got lots of questions coming in. So I'm gonna give uh, two to Ricardo and two to Brad. I will start with Ricardo. I have. Dhruba Padyal from Kathmandu, who's asking, the US seems to be the dominant decision maker in controlling the spillover of financial shocks. Why do other countries not support the US to help control inflation so that the benefits are shared for the good of all? And then let me, uh, Brad, let me give you one just so you can think about it while Ricardo is answering. From James Rice, an LSE summer school alumni. Uh, in what way do political concerns play a role in countries countries determining how they manage foreign exchange rates for their currencies? How might exchange rate strategies shape the inflation landscape, particularly in the developing world during the next six months? So Ricardo, would you like to go first? Sure. So my answer can be brief. I mean, um, as, as you noted, uh, many will benefit if the US say, controls inflation. Uh, then you ask, why doesn't the rest of the world help the US? And the answer is simply that I don't think the U.S. needs help to control its inflation. Exactly. America can just do the job. Um, so and I understand your point, but I think that the U.S. can deliver on low inflation by itself. Note that you might argue that maybe that would not be the case if, again, the shock to energy were such that we made it very hard for the Fed by itself to achieve that. I don't think that's the case. I think the impact of the energy price on inflation was very strong, but was really 12 months ago. Um, maybe 15, 18 months ago. Um, the fact that we have high inflation now, I don't think has actually all that much to do with the energy crisis. You have to remember that inflation is the change in the price. I mean, prices are high in energy, but if anything, the change in those prices is now either very low or even negative in some regards. And that's not what's keeping inflation high. It's the fact that that's spilled over to other parts. And therefore, that coordination, I don't think is, I think basically the Fed doesn't need it. Um, the Fed should just do its job and then we'll all benefit in that regard. Great. Brad, do you want to take the question about exchange rate strategy and how that might shape inflation? Well, I I think the the preface to the question was about how political concerns uh, influence uh, exchange rate choices. And I think there's a great irony in the global system in the sense that 
Uh, some of the countries that have linked their currencies most strongly to the dollar are countries that aren't actually the United States friends um, in a politically uh, geostrategic sense. Uh, China still manages its currency primarily against the dollar. And obviously, everybody is talking about strategic rivalry and strategies to make sure strategic rivalry doesn't spill over and become something uh, much more damaging. The Saudis manage their currencies very tightly, tightly to the dollar. Pakistan tied to the dollar. Um, it is There is no real correlation there. If anything, the correlation is the closer you are in a strategic sense to the US, the more likely you are to allow uh, your currency to float purely against the dollar. Mm -hmm. So there is something uh, a little bit strange about the global system. Uh, obviously, the big shock uh, has been the freezing of Russia's reserves. Um, and I think the, the interesting aspect of Russia was that Russia was the, obviously not a US ally, but over time it had made the largest effort to decouple both its exchange rate management and its reserves from the United States. It had over time moved to managing more against a basket, much more heavily against the Euro, and the bulk of its reserves had been shifted to the Euro and to the Yuan. Amongst the big economies, uh, China was the one, or sorry, Russia was the one that had really minimized its dollar holdings. Uh, but when the G7 acted in a coordinated way, moving out of the dollar didn't offer any uh, increased uh, protection from sanctions. In general, I think the lesson uh, uh, from this episode, uh, and Ricardo will, Ricardo and I will disagree on what the long run uh, lesson will be, but I think one lesson is that holding reserves turns out to be even more useful as an inflation fighting concern than was realized because it gives you an added degree of freedom where you can intervene to keep your currency from depreciating uh, too much uh, during periods of stress. And if that works, you can avoid importing a little bit of extra inflation. Mm -hmm. And so I think the countries that have been most successful at not following the Fed and not having their exchange rates uh, depreciate too much and facing a, a voluntary import uh, inflation, imported inflation shock have been those that have paid the price and had excess reserves going into the shock. Okay, very good. Uh, and I've got a historical question for Ricardo from Kathleen Tyson. I've long believed that Kissinger did more to end high inflation in the 1980s than Paul Volcker. Cheap Russian energy and resources lowered production costs due to detente. Opening China brought huge disinfl disinflationary production efficiencies. Could a new global security framework that brings Russian energy and resources back and embraces China as a collaborative global peer reduce global inflation again now? So let, let me split my answer to two parts of that. I never it thought is, of Kissinger as a central banker, but there you go. <laughs> it is certainly the case that uh, in the same way that a negative, let me broadly call it supply shock, caused an increase in inflation, a positive, positive sense of beneficial supply shock could bring inflation down faster. Um, if you look at the diagnosis of the last two years, the combination of, again, a pandemic shock that affected demand in a way that turned out not to be too persistent, the but affected supply in a much more persistent way than affected demand. Mm -hmm. The oil price shocks, the difficulties in the production chains that happened, all of those contributed for the inflation to rise. If you want to start imagining opposites of that, you would end up with something I think similar to what you suggested, Kathleen, which is, well, imagine now that we had not just bringing Ru Russian energy resources back, but hey, I'll double down on that. What if we had some innovations in the energy sector that imply that energy is now permanently and forever cheaper? On top of that, on the demand supply and balance and problems in the research, chain, what if you said embracing China as a collateral global peer? Let's go even further. What if we got that we have a new wave of globalization that allowed for even more efficiency that lowered costs and made more robust the system? Absolutely, in some ways, that will bring inflation down. In some ways, it will help a lot along the way. So 
yes, if you have positive shocks in that way, they will help. The key word there is shocks. Um, there is, they have to be things that kind of come as a bit of a surprise. There are things that absolutely policy can engineer potentially, but in both of these examples that we just gave, making energy cheaper for a long time, making supply chains more resilient and cheaper, again, more efficient forever. I would think that inflation is not even the number one reason why you'd want to do those things, as opposed to the number nine reason, or even I, 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 I'd struggle even to put it in the top five of those. Uh, and so when it came to inflation, those would just be beneficial side arguments for doing these things that mm. could potentially be higher. So I wouldn't say put that as a table as something, well, because of that, and because I have my sad economic education telling me about $100 bills in the sidewalk, I would say, well, those are such $100 side bills that have been there for a while. It's not because inflation made them $101 bills that all of a sudden they're going to get picked up when they weren't before. And so I'm a little skeptical that that would be my main anti-inflation with them. Second answer, which is a little bit what Minouche already alluded to, you know, I think, uh, or I certainly both in my research as well as in my views on inflation, and there are some disagreements, but I think I would argue that this is a dominant view, at least, that ultimately inflation is controlled by monetary policy. It is the case that shocks may make it easier or hard to control inflation. And when control, when I say control, I do not mean hitting 2% every year. You may have wonderful monetary policy and still have inflation going up. I think that if we had had perfect monetary policy in the last two years, inflation would still have gone up to 6%. 10, I think, was a mistake of monetary policy and had to do with bad monetary policy in, in, at some points. But hey, um, but still, you would have had some. But ultimately, monetary policy control inflation. Now, that means that, and I've used an abuse, so maybe some of you have heard me do the analogy, the way I think about shocks in the central bank is in the question of, if I go out and it's raining right now and my head gets all wet, do I say, well, is the cause the rain? Well, yes, of course. But at the same time, is it my fault? Yes, because I could have carried an umbrella. I see monetary policy as the umbrella. There are shocks, but monetary policy is the one that chooses to open more of the umbrella or less of the umbrella, and therefore determines whether my head gets wet or not. Ultimately, it is monetary policy that does that. And I will support this view, which I hold quite strongly, um, with the institutional rates we have in the world. It simply only makes sense to give central banks an depends and inflation target if we think that monetary policy can deliver on inflation. And for the last 25 years, we have done so with great success, I would say. And therefore, nothing leads me to question that view. So to conclude, answer is absolutely good shocks would happen. But the ones you describe, I think they would have happened regardless of inflation, or not inflation. And two, it is ultimately, I think, I think Volcker, as you put in Volcker versus Kissinger, Kissinger may have helped, but ultimately it is Volcker that brought inflation down. <laughs> Okay, very good, very good. Uh, the next one is for Brad. It's from Anthony, who's an LSE alum. And he asks, how will inflation be affected if the World Bank, IMF, and other development banks increase their lending as is being lobbied for to pay for climate development and COVID recovery? And how much headroom do they have before weakening their credit ratings? I think that's an issue that's near to your heart. Uh, yeah. Um, so I think there's a couple of components to to this uh, argument. I mean, part of the uh, the answer is I think the same answer that Ricardo gave that um, that uh, an increase in lending is a positive shock that tends to increase demand and uh, raise capacity for inf for investment. Um, over time, that would increase the productive capacity of the economy. But in general, for managing the inflationary consequences of that, you would look to the central bank and expect the central bank to be able to uh, contain any uh, inflationary pressure from an increase in IMF and World Bank lending. You wouldn't say the Pro there's necessarily a problem that comes from that lending because the countries won't be able to manage the associated uh, inflation pressure. I think that's particularly the case now because the problem that most countries are facing is that they, they're seeing the withdrawal of existing funding uh, without new sources of money coming in. So if the World Bank and IMF don't step up, the the effect will be uh, depressive, deflationary, negative, uh, because countries will be forced to contract in order to generate foreign exchange to repay legacy debts. And that will uh, impede 
their ability to make needed investments for the future. You know, low-income countries have much more rapid population growth. They need more infrastructure. They need clean energy infrastructure. Uh, there's an enormous scope for making those investments. Um, in terms of debt capacity, it's a fair and important question. And I think there's two different components to the answer or three different components to the answer. Uh, one component is, and I think this is where I kind of sometimes get a little annoyed at the IMF World Bank statistic that says like 60% of low income economies are on the edge of debt distress. Um, there's a lot of countries that are on the edge of debt distress, but there are some pretty big and important countries that aren't. So not every low income country has taken on more debt than it can manage. Some have. Uh, I would say it's more like 30% than 60%, but we can debate that. So there's a set of countries where there isn't really uh, an issue. There's a Second component to the answer, which is that if you believe these investments are necessary and they're being impeded by an excessive stock of debt today, which is unambiguously the case for some, you know, the the debt distressed, uh, uh, the leading examples of debt distress like Zambia and Sri Lanka and Ghana, then part of the assessment of where their debt needs to be at the end of the restructuring uh, is uh, it will be based on a judgment about what kind of borrowing will be needed to build the necessary infrastructure in the future for the economy to grow. So you have to adjust to some degree your assessment of how much legacy debt an economy can support uh, based on an, a sense of the financing it needs to grow going forward. And then the third answer is that debt capacity is not independent of the kind of debt. There are some kinds of debt that are much more risky that carry higher costs. Uh, market borrowing for a frontier economy is going to cost you 10% uh, and it's going to be available for five years in dollars. Best case. Uh, you can't finance a lot of infrastructure with that kind of financing. In order to finance power projects, roads, infrastructure, you probably need lower rate 30 year kind of money. And I think that we have to be, we as a world need to recognize uh, that the multilateral development institutions can, can and should play a bigger role in providing that kind of financing for the countries that now need it. I've got two, I'm gonna try and squeeze in two questions in the remaining two minutes, uh, and I'll let you each choose whichever one you'd like. Uh, so Hugh Sanderman from LSE Ideas asks, is a degree of institutional coordination required between those central banks seeking to reduce their balance sheets post QE, given the implications for monetary policy and financial stability arising from, reverse, from the reversal of QE? And then Eugene Tan, who is an MSc student at LSE, uh, says both speakers have mentioned the key role of the U.S. as a reason for not needing an international accord. However, in light of the greater desire for decoupling, to what extent would greater decoupling require greater mechanisms to coordinate global management of exchange rates and inflation? So I'll answer so, very briefly the first one, since I've done a lot of work on QE. Um, I think there's certainly, you know, we're still understanding very well QE and its effects and others, especially because there's a big divorce often between here theory and what has been some of the experience. And it's just a very active area for work that many people here at the LSE and other places are doing. But I will say just very briefly that five years ago or more than five years ago, some time ago, there was a time at which the US did a very, very moderate decline in QE. And this had massive impacts in terms of other countries. And this became known as the taper tantrum at the time. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, over the, and so for a while it was seen, well, whenever you do exactly a reduction of balance sheet, you're gonna need a lot of coordination uh, internationally because this can have a massive impact on capital flow dislocation. Again, it was a little bit hard to justify this in theory, uh, why there was such a big taper tantrum. And I think people really struggle. I think we still don't understand well in the terms of understanding exactly the mechanism of what caused such a large reaction that. But luckily, we got a second data point. Actually, we got a few more data points. And that is that in the last 12 to 18 months, there's been, at different extents, different major central banks have done uh, both, well, initially 24 months ago, another big expansion QE, but also some reduction of different types. And there's been no tantrums whatsoever. That is, there's been very little in terms of um, 
massive disruptions and capital flows coming from that. So I think there's been, there has to be a big updating by anyone who's intellectually serious and say, well, maybe this reducing the balance of QE actually doesn't need as much trash coordination as if I was answering your question four years ago. I think also some caution would say, I wouldn't go as far as say, we need no international coordination whatsoever on this. So I say the truth is likely going to be a little bit in between. But beyond that, Hugh, I think the, the answer ends up being, my theoretical priors is that you wouldn't need all that much. Those theoretical priors were really upended seven years ago, but now the data has moved towards my theoretical priors in the first place. So <laughs> I'm not sure that we need so much, but I would certainly be cautious if I was there. This is like the opposite of Keynes's quote, when the data changes, I change my mind here. In this case, the, the data, data changed. changed in favor and reinforced your previous views. So that's good. <laughs> Brad, would you like to take the question on... Um, on uh... On the decoupling. The decoupling, yeah, and the risk inflation. Uh, sure. I may uh, I may throw in a few comments on the the question of uh, QE because I think it's uh, it's also interesting. Um, the first observation is like, wow. Uh, right now, the ten year is like whatever, like three six in the U.S. Well below short term interest rates. I don't know what Ricardo's estimates of the term premium are, uh, but if you'd asked me a year ago what the shrinkage of the Fed's balance sheet would mean, I would have certainly thought it would have made it harder for the curve to invert this deeply. Um, it should have put a little bit of added pressure on long term interest rates. So I, I, I think we're still struggling to figure out exactly how QE works, to be honest. Um, you know, the old Bernanke quote about it seems to work in practice, but not in theory. Uh, the withdrawal is maybe working in practice, but not in theory. Uh, I, I, it makes everything a little bit more difficult just because I don't think there is a coherent, agreed estimate for how in practice bond purchases flow through the economy. That said, I do worry that in the Euro area, uh, it's the uh, asset purchases both reinforce the solidity of the block because of the, EC the ECB and national central banks were buy buying the debt of riskier economies at the same time as they were buying the debt of stronger economies. So the impact of reversing of QE is that it puts a lot more of the debt of Italy and Spain and Portugal and others onto the market. Um, and uh, ECB liabilities uh, also go down. So I think there's a different, a potential impact from the reversal of QE in the euro area that is not present in other countries. You know, the weird thing about decoupling between the US and China um, is that in some ways uh, decoupling, if it were to happen, uh, and if it were to happen in monetary ways, uh, might eliminate uh, at least one historic source of friction between the US and China. And by that, I mean, China's management of its currency against the dollar was arguably a form of coupling in the sense of it integrated to a degree monetary policy between the United States, but it was also a source of friction um, because uh, the U.S. didn't always agree with the level at which China was uh, pegging its currency. So you can imagine uh, a decoupling of the in the uh, monetary realm where China is uh, autonomous, uh, it lets the yuan float, and that that reduces tension. You can also imagine that the process of getting there will be an extraordinary shock. Uh, the world is now used to a managed Chinese currency. The Chinese economy is used to a managed currency. And the equilibrium level of the yuan that would emerge if China really pulled back and just had uh, an unfettered or mostly unfettered financial account or even a mostly unfettered currency is a, a, a great unknown. Some other forms of decoupling uh, in the short run, if they were to happen, uh, would likely uh, be uh, modest in my view, but directionally uh, not, not trivial supply shocks that would tend to add to frictions and add to the level of, uh, of prices. Um, and so that would make uh, life a little bit more difficult. The caution I would place on all this 
is that I, I don't think it is well internalized uh, just how much uh, China reintegrated into the global economy as a result of China's policy choices over the pandemic. China didn't stimulate its economy. It didn't stimulate its own households. It relied on exports not domestic demand to support and strength to pull its economy through the pandemic shock. China is now exporting a trillion dollars more to the world than it did before the pandemic. Exports are two to three percentage points larger as a share of Chinese GDP than they were before the pandemic. So there's going to be some uh, natural unwind of some of this kind of uh, increased globalization that no one has acknowledged that occurred because of the discrepancy in policy responses to the pandemic uh, that I think would just be natural and healthy. And then there's a much bigger question about how you uncouple, if it were to be a significant decoupling, how you uncouple chains of production that in some ways uh, emerge from the pandemic in a more integrated, not less integrated way. Uh, and I don't know for sure that the policy decision to do a full, serious decoupling has actually been taken. Okay. All right. I think we need to wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Ricardo and Brad, for excellent conversation and presentations. I think you've persuaded us that we don't need an international accord to bring inflation down, but we need a lot better international economic policy making to manage the ups and downs of inflation, exchange rates, capital flows, and debt. Uh, and that there are many important issues and questions that we need to think about to get to a world where we do a better job of managing all of those risks and so that shocks can be less disruptive and that we can have, what is that magical G7, G20 word, sustainable and shared growth. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much and thank you to the audience for some excellent questions and I hope you join us again for future conversations around global economic governance. Goodbye, everyone.